Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon's like times we are back again. Got my boy Justin Richard. What's up, guys? What's going on? This what is up? What up? A hot topic, a debate, if you will. The good news is we are not here to be preachers and give a big sermon or a lecture. We are here to have a very open dialogue. And here's the backstory of, of why this podcast happened. The title of if you missed it, I'm sure it's probably why you clicked on and want to listen to it. And this is what we're going to talk about for the next however long we go, is what would happen if we did not, us as recreational anglers, did not keep a single fish for an entire year, three years or five years. I don't even know. It, to me, it sounds crazy. And I'm not advocating that we should. But the question came up, what would happen if we did? And, and here's why. Sims, the the fly fishing you know company, the apparel company, put out a a really hard hitting and kind of in your face video recently that we kind of watched as a is is a team, and uh, it long story short is about the striper fishing up in uh, up north and Montauk there, which is like the striper capital of the world, and it's been a big thing for many many decades. And and if you're into striper fishing up there, you know that, and you also know that it was like at a peak. And then it went way down and then it like got really good again, like, like the good old days. And now it's kind of bad again, where even guys are having trouble catching stripers in the places they used to. They're not up in the, in the rivers and the streams. They're just, they're not behaving like they should. And Sims really kind of painted a picture that it's the recreational angle. They didn't mention commercial fishermen once. Cause a lot of times, and I, I'm the same way, right? Well, man, it's those commercial guys uh, that they said, that's not the problem. And, and they even interviewed just, normal joe blows and some guys in the area and said that recreational guys and gals are the problem because the state you know gives a limit right let's just say it's four stripers a day or whatever it is and there's many people that have the mindset where i gotta limit out as quick as i can and i get it like I, i've done that before uh i think we, everyone in this call has and so the the long and short of it is the, the the end of it kind of said it, it comes down to education right it comes down we got a lot we have what four million new f fishermen in america and a lot of them don't have the education on how to hold a fish correctly that's that's also a part of it right is mishandling and fish dying because we're mishandling or keeping it out of the water too long but there is also probably a little bit of lack of education for some newer anglers that do think hey man i'm going to look it up on my fish rules app and i'm allowed to keep you know whatever xyz fish for the day and like let's let's keep them let's have dinner right and i don't blame them because that's the limit right they're legally allowed to uh but this video was like we might want to take a look at all that and we might want to almost kind of challenge some of the state limits they, they might be way off because the the up there they basically admitted we were off right because science and data is great but if you can't keep up with the amount of anglers and the amount of people catching fish, which you can't on a real time basis, it's always going to be lagging. And so that's the long story short. So the point of this is to do a little education and two to get feedback. Like we, we want this to be one of the most hopefully commented on posts of just your honest feedback, regardless of what you did in the past. Cause my brother Luke and I, and, and our dad and grandfather, that, we did it, man. Like uh, we, we know, I think Richard offline, you call them dock picks, right? We all went there and you want to come back to the dock and marina or the boat ramp or the cleaning table with as many fish as possible. It's like what you did. And I've been on trips in Texas, Louisiana. That's still what they did. You got to limit out as quick as possible. And, and that might not be the answer. I, I also don't think we should just stop keeping any fish for a year forever. I don't know that that's the right answer to The answer is probably somewhere in the middle, but this is going to be a wide open discussion. And I got Justin and Richard on here because, um, Justin's got all kinds of background in fisheries and, and management and has uh, raised quite a few fish on his own in, in, uh, in, in large extreme areas. And uh, Richard's, you know, been up there in, uh, in Georgia and the Carolinas and has seen some ebbs and flows with certain species. And a lot of it comes down to the wreck guys. There's certain species like flounder in some states and redfish in some states. There, there's no commercial fishery for it. So it can't just be the commercial guys. Uh, and so it, a lot of it does come back to us as recreational people to, to think long-term, not just short-term. So I'll be quiet. That was a super long intro. Uh, who wants to kick it off? Where do you guys want to, want to go with this one? Cause I know it's, whoo, it's a hot potato, hot potato. Who wants it? Yeah. I mean, you, oh, you know, start, wants that hot potato. There you go. let's get into it. So, you know, starting off, you know, I'll raise my hand first saying I am 
have been a part of that, like what we call the dock picks and maxing out your limits and been, you know, as an early angler and a lot of it, you know, I do want to say was we never had, a, you know, a quote unquote problem, you know, and ever since I could remember there it was just always fish. You never had a problem. You always limited out. Your buddies always limited out literally every time you went out, um, you know, which was awesome. So you just never really registered that, hey, there may be a problem. Um, and this was, like I said, a lot earlier in my angling career. And the more that I've got into it, the more that I've read studies, um, gotten into the biology of fish, and especially over here, kind of like in the southeast area, um, a lot of these fish, believe it or not, are actually resident fish. And these are studies done by like DNRs, you know, in the Carolinas, Georgia, all that. Um, you know, so you got to think, you know, if you're going out and, you know, go for, you know, even a weekend and you, you limit out and say there's two or three anglers on a boat, you know, I think Georgia's 15 right now for, for trout, um, you know, but then just right here down the line in Northeast Florida, really the same type of habitat, really for the most part, but then we can only keep five. Um, so that's something to think about as well is, okay, you know, are we going to really look into and, you know, trust the state right now? Cause that's what we've done for years. However, one common thing is that we are kind of declining. Um, and I've seen this, you know, over the years. And like I said, I was a part of it, you know, early on, but, you know, one thing that I've seen, you know, like example for redfish, we had a really, a uh, pretty low redfish uh, population for a while because there was not really that much of a limit. There wasn't an upper slot for bulls or anything like that. And then DNR came in and they said, hey, we're going to, you know, make this a slot. We're going to, you know, limit you to maybe 10 or 15 fish. And then it started backing down from there. And then within, I think it was really about a year or two, our redfish population just exploded. And it was like, it was awesome. I mean, you could limit out to your 10 redfish every single time you went, no problem. And then now we're starting to go back down again. So it's like, okay, you got to think a little bit like what really, you know, is, you know, a big significant cause and there's freezes and things like that. And natural factors that Justin's talked about, you know, we can get into that some too, but when you look at the, the common denominator, one of the biggest things that's increased is the amount of anglers. We just have a whole lot more, uh, you know, lines and hooks in the water. So, you know, I'm on the same, same side of the fence with you, Joe, like I love keeping fish, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, the more that I've done it, the more I'm starting to see how, you know, re recreationally we can wipe out, you know, an entire school of fish very quickly, um, especially if there's some higher limits. So it's definitely something to be thinking about, um, you know, just be cognizant of when you're out there. And so to, to go back to that Sims video, and we'll put a link in the show notes as well, so you can watch it yourself, we'll probably just embed it in there. The, the striper fishing was so good back, this was quite a few decades ago, it was so good that all the recreational anglers, even the guides, everyone was like, give us, give us more, right? Move up the slots, make them wider, let us keep more. And, and they did. And they almost wiped out an entire fishery. I mean, it got to the point where it was closer going extinct than anything else. Like they were literally, it was almost getting impossible to catch a striper according to everyone who was fishing that area. And they went, I, I believe it was five years, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I watched it earlier this week, but I thought it was five years where they kept nothing like zero. You cannot keep a striper for five years. And people were furious as you can imagine, especially going from like all these limits to zero, but that but mother nature took hold and, and and the people who were there said after that five years it didn't happen overnight it didn't happen year one or year two but i think towards the end all of a sudden that fishery was back to where it started and that was when they were looking in the mirror saying man we were the the problem and they kept the limits low but it kept getting better right and we kept getting greedy meaning us as rec anglers because we've been a part of it as well here even in the last couple of years like well man like it's so easy to catch a trout or a redfish in here they, they should they should move the limit up. And I, I understand why so I completely get it, but now they move those limits up and now they're back to where they were, where now people are saying, man, it's really, really hard to catch stripers consistently. Like, uh, like we used to, and, and there is, there's, you know, we had red tide and nasty sewage spills and, and all that ties into it. But that was the first time I saw a video like that, that didn't blame any of that and, and didn't blame, 
commercial fishing because i don't i don't think there is a commercial fishery up there for stripers that I, I could be wrong but correct me if i am but it literally said the smoking gun is is recreational anglers and i was like dang uh and, and it kind of made me look take a look at ourselves I was like you know are we are we part of the problem down here in florida I, I don't know that's part of the whole discussion what do you think justin i think that uh i have had opportunities over the years to work with fwc uh on the uh, on their on their breeding side, so FWC does have breeding facilities for for redfish, and there were times in previous jobs that I've had where I was able to take some of their breeding redfish and have them on exhibit to teach people about animals. And but in that relationship, I got to meet a number of people at FWC and people responsible for uh, for stock assessment throughout the state to help determine what the state of the fishery looks like. And time and time, they would tell me that. The biggest challenge they have in terms of collecting accurate data is getting people to provide the data to them. Yeah. So, you know, they can't be on the water everywhere at once to get a good baseline of what the red fishing fishery, you know, looks like on the West Coast of Florida. They rely on anglers to give them that information. And it seems like if there's, you know, eight or 10 different demographics of types of fishermen that fish different ways, different styles, different times of the year they're only getting a, a, a piece of, of a 50 piece puzzle, you know, and they're, they're getting limited information. And therefore when they make a decision on whether there's a limit for a certain species or, uh, or a size, you know, regulation of up to what size you can keep. A lot of that has to do with the public input and the public feedback about what's happening. Um, but even then not everybody publicly goes out and says, yeah, I mean, I absolutely slayed it today or no, I didn't get anything in this area the people that have those rest stops back at the ramp where they say, what did you catch? How many did you catch? You know, that's, that's really helpful. They are using that as the baseline to help determine what's happening in the area. They aren't going out and electro fishing and getting a, a giant population and saying, okay, here's my model. And then it must work, you know, based on this many number of miles, that's not their means of collecting data and determining these, these regulations. They do it based on your feedback and your attendance to seminars and, 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 uh, and summits where they're talking about these matters and they want to hear collectively, they, they monitor all that. And then they make a determination on what they believe is best for, for fishermen, you know, I mean, for the fish and for fishermen, they try to take all that in consideration, but the data is limited. And I mean, I've been guilty for one for not attending these things and, and voicing my, my experiences on the water to help them determine what's right or what's, you know, what direction they should go in terms of managing one species to another. Um, it's tough. I, I've, I've seen over the past couple of years, you know, certain species go from no management whatsoever to kind of a base blanket coverage of 10 per person per day or 10 per vessel, whichever is greater. That kind of tends to be like the blanket means of, of managing or regulating a certain species. Blackfin tuna was one of them that I'm, I'm an advocate for fishing for tuna. And obviously tuna are highly migratory, but you know, people kind of took it for granted and thought it's a big ocean. They come through, they're there one day, you catch as many as you want keep 20, 30 tuna, the charter guys down in the Keys would keep a ton. And then some questions got brought up like, well, we're not seeing as many smaller tuna come through. Like, does this have to do with us not regulating or managing that fishery? The questions came up, people looked into it and based on the public feedback at these summits and seminars were, hey, let's, let's just take a look at this and let's make some sort of step towards maybe helping that fishery rebound. We're not saying anybody can or can't keep fish. We're just asking, can we be doing it better? Can we be better about this to allow for, you know, that same level of enjoyment to be available three years, five years down the line for our next generation of our family to enjoy? You know, that's, that's the biggest question. Um, I remember one thing, this isn't so much related to catch and keep, but in terms of involvement to help keeping a fishery, you know, robust for years to come. In Florida, we had a freeze in 09 and, and 2010, and it was a big deal to snook fishermen. Oh, yeah. uh, I think FWC reported that 60%, and that's a big number, 60% of the population of snook were, were, were decimated from this freeze. I think that is difficult to determine. I'm sure a lot of that had to go off of, this is our most accurate information of a stock assessment. This is how many we've collected as deceased samples. So based on this collection, we're saying that this is the percentage that has been wiped off of you know, the population here in Florida. That's a big number. I was a part of a team to try to create 
a grant proposal to NOAA to try to implement artificial means of heating to offer a sanctuary for snook to rebound during winter months. I mean, that, that's, that's my level of involvement and kind of thinking outside the box to help make sure that that fishery can be enjoyed by the next generation of fishermen, my kids someday. I hope that my kids can go enjoy catching a 40 inch snook and it would be frustrating to know that we as a community of fishermen didn't do things to try to help make sure that that rebounded and that we offered that chance for the next generation. So to your point, Joe, like the biggest thing is thinking instead of the here and now of what's happening right now, what can I go catch or keep on, on my dinner plate? There's no problem with that, but also think long term of what's going to happen five years from now to our fishery. How do I tie into that equation and the decisions I make now, how are they going to affect you know, the, the, what that fishery is going to look like down the road. Yeah. Well, unfortunately we, we as, as humans don't really change that much as, as we age, you know, there's that study where they put the 10 little kids, I think they were four years old in a, in a, you know, one of those rooms where they get to watch them in the mirror and, and they, they gave them the option. They said, all right, you can have one chocolate chip cookie now, or if you just wait, it was like 20 minutes, right. For a kid. And if you just wait 20 minutes, then you can have two. And none of them took it, right? And then they all want that one cookie now. They don't want to wait. And, and, and we're similar. Obviously, we're now, now talking, you know, 20 minutes to a year. Um, but it, 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 is, it is tough. It's tough for all of us, right? It's, it's a big part of this discussion. Because uh, you mentioned your kids, right? It, it, it gets a little bit more powerful when you start talking about kids and grandkids and your legacy. And so if I asked you, Justin, said, all right, would you be willing right now to say, I'm not going to keep another fish for the next, let's just say year, like a long term, two years, three years, but it would guarantee that your kids and grandkids would have plentiful fish and it would be like the good old days. And most people would probably say, yeah, when, when it phrased that way, but then everyone else will say, well, what about all the other people that are keeping them? What about the commercial? And say, it's, it's really, really, really tough to just, you know, put a blanket over it and say, this is the rules. You also brought another thing about, you know, tuna and, and migratory species, you know, stripers don't just sit in one area. And at the very end of that Sims video, they talked about how they are moving up and down the coast, uh, you know, from that, you know, upper New York and heck they're in Virginia. Right. And, and sometimes even the Carolinas, depending on water temps and yet every state has different rules. So they brought up why, why are states running this thing in the first place? Why don't we like look at this on a bigger picture? And I thought that was interesting because you mentioned it too, Richard, right? You live really close to the border of Florida and Georgia. One area, like you could literally be in one spot and the limit is five trout, let's just say. And in a stone's throw, I mean, you literally, you could take your boat just a couple miles up and all of a sudden be in Georgia. The same thing had happened in Georgia and the Carolinas. And all of a sudden now the limit's 10 or 15. I mean, just a mile away. Is that fishery that much different? Are you saying, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, rhetorical, it, rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it though, you know, just logically, you know, it's half a mile to the mile, you know, now granted it's not always going to be right on the border, but I mean, when you have the same type of areas and we actually teach that, you know, here at Salt Strong where, you know, we've all got, you know, brackish water, a lot, really extensive marsh systems. I mean, just beautiful area. Um, and a lot of it's preserved and everything like that um, as well. So a lot of it's protected and going back to a lot of these are resident fish as well. You know, so you got to think if, you know, a majority, say 60 percent or more of these fish are residents and they stay within the same maybe 10 miles, you know, their entire lifespan. You know, if you continue to pound on that, you know, that school um, or group of fish, it's kind of just simple math, you know, at that point. Um, but yeah, going back to that, you know, cobia is another one that has seen tremendous ups and downs, but same thing going all the way up the coast, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Georgia's different, Carolina's different all the way up to Virginia. And it's like, well, why are these guys getting to keep, you know, five fish when we can keep one or two, or, you know, yeah. it's, it's really kind of like, they're the same fish. It's just in a different area you know, they're moving. So that's something that I think is really needing to be looked at as well, um, you know, more on a grand level, because it's the same fish, you know, they're just different parts of the year and the season going to different areas. And so much of it is going to come down to, to leaders, uh, you know, like 
like salt strong to to fishing guides uh, play probably one of the bigger roles you know because they're out i mean every day you know taking two to four or five people and and having an impact on what those people believe is the right way to fish right and i was super proud super proud of like the i don't know if it was all of them but it was a big chunk of the tampa bay guides so if you guys don't know what happened we have you know this piney point just disaster massive massive fish kill and then somehow fwc based on some data said hey let's open it back up and we were all shocked and i thought it was so cool the guides for the most part came together and said i don't care what the rules are we're all going to agree kind of like form a pack not to keep anything and just be honest with our clients listen we just had one of the biggest fish kills in our in our lifetime let's let this thing recover and not take anything home and guess what it, from from what I've heard from some of them that I reached out to, they've had like zero cancellations. They've had zero people mad with it. People understand when you can back it up with a, a real reason why. And I thought that was awesome. That was so kudos to you, Tampa Bay guides, and and, and all over that the the Gulf there that that were impacted by that. I know it you know went now from Clearwater, Boca Grande. I mean, it was a pretty big area that got impacted. And it was so cool to see those guides do that because the opposite thing is happening in Louisiana. Luke and I take a trip there every year. And, you know, that is certainly a place where it is, it's for meat lovers. Like you, you, if you're flying there, you fly back your, your fish. And if you're driving from wherever the, in the South or Louisiana, New Orleans, you're bringing back the biggest cooler you possibly can fit in the back of your pickup truck. And so I remember the first time we went there, you know, we had a killer day, kept no fish. Uh, and, and we just felt bad to go in a different state. That's not ours, even though obviously we paid for a fishing license and stuff. We, we just felt bad keeping fish and we get back to the lodge and it was a lot more locals there. And they were all, the whole conversation was about how fast did you get back to the lodge? It literally was like, that was the bragging rights. That was like, show me how tough you are. Cause that means you limit it out. Like you don't come back until you limit it out. Right. And so I think the limit there at the time was like 16 trout, 16 specs per angler. You got five anglers on a boat. I mean, start doing the math five times 16 for each boat. And that's, they're doing this day in and day out. And this was just one little lodge. And then the guides, you know, we stayed over overnight at that lodge and we're having some beers with the guides. These guys have been there for decades. And, and they're all saying, man, like it, it's getting tougher and tougher to do this. You know, it used to be, we can come back in an hour. Now it's taking three or four hours to limit out. And, and, but, but they understood the problem, but they were also afraid like, well, man, if I say we're not going to limit out, then I'm going to lose all my customers. Cause they, they come to me, at least they, that's their perception. They come to me because, you know, they get to take a bunch of fish home, a bunch of meat home. And, uh, and Luke and I both like on the way home, we're like, man, like it's come on guys. Like we all know there's a problem. It's taking four times as long to limit out. You're even saying your, your traditional honey holes are now all dried up because you guys have caught so many, like at some point you got to change. And that, that takes leadership and it, it takes some guts. Uh, I know we had, um, uh, what are their names is the outfitters, uh, husband and wife team uh in, in that venice louise area and they're one of the few that do that uh minus you know some some yellowfin tuna or something but for all their inshore stuff it's a hundred percent catch and release and they're they were one of the first guides to to do that in uh in louisiana and, and kind of bucked a trend and people thought they were crazy but they keep getting customers uh, so you know kudos to them so it, it is going to take a mind a mindset shift and uh and not to not to throw everything back but just to just to be a little bit more educated and a little bit more longer term thinking like, you know what? I don't really have to have this when we already got three. I, even though the limit's five, I don't really need to have two more. It's probably just going to sit in my freezer and go bad. That that's really what we're talking about here. Cause I, I think Dave Flad, you know, he's the release over 20. We've had him on the podcast. He, he's probably got it the most, right? I don't know if anyone's got it perfect, but I mean, it, it's tough to argue with what he's talking about. I mean, he's saying, Hey, these trout and now he's going to sheep's head and, floundered some other species but the trout is where release over 20 started and all of the breeders are over 20 inches i mean all of the recreation of trout like literally the future of trout is 100 percent on the 20 year over trout like you can't refute it those are all the females that that's those are the ones giving birth those are the ones laying eggs those are the ones that are literally responsible for growing big trout going forward so maybe it does make sense to not keep a 25 or 27 or even a 22 inch trout and that's pretty powerful. Now he's got thousands and thousands of people that have done it. And it's, it's become quite a, quite a movement. And I think that's probably right. Cause he's not, he's saying, man, if they're under 20 inches, 
keep the limit all you want. It's really not going to impact us that much, but, but no, no state has done that, right? There's no regulations minus his is more of just a movement that's uh, that said that. What, what do you guys think? I know Justin's dying to chime in. Yeah, no, I just, I really want to see a doc shot of up on the pegs back of the ramp in Louisiana. You've got like steaks and grilled chicken and like and other things up there and someone's holding up a catch and it's two burger patties and like it's comical but it builds awareness right like i came back and i still enjoyed some fantastic food but i also hear some catches of of my fish on the water to show that like i still legit could have gone and done it but i chose not to do it so that i can go do the same thing again tomorrow like it's a comical thing but i think it would bring a lot of awareness of like look at the awesome burgers i get to eat back at the lodge like that's, that's all I can think right now. So anybody that's listening, please feel free to do that in your own, like back, back at the dock shot, take, take some, uh, take some ribeyes and pop them up on the pegs. Cause, cause it does. I mean, for me, like I love eating flounder. I love eating cobia, Richard. I had a great day fishing for cobia here recently. Um, you know, and like, I'm not, I'm not opposed to keeping and eating fish. Like it's sometimes I feel like they were put here for us to be able to eat. But at the same time, I want to be able to enjoy that long-term and I want everybody else to enjoy it long-term. It's not, it's not all about me. It's about, it's about us together, you know, as, as a whole community. Um, That was just the biggest thing. I just, I want to hang a, hang a steak on a rack now. That's all. I I love it. (laughs) I love it. And and on, on that though, because we we discuss discuss this with these guides quite a bit and and, in their eyes, I'm not going to name guides names or anything, but if they said it, it's bigger than just them, right? Think if they're going to lose business, they, even this goes up to like high ranking officials, you might not even fish, but they're looking at is New Orleans and uh, in South, like Venice, this whole area. I mean, it, it's, it brings in a lot of money of uh, brings in a lot of flights for people who want to go down there and sportsman paradise and, and do a lot of fishing. And I mean, in their mindset, well, man, if we, if we drop the limits, like in half, we're going to lose out on a lot of money. I mean, it, so it, it it's, this is big picture. There's a lot of moving parts and thoughts really, really wild. But that was the first time I saw so eye opening. Like we were, Luke and I were the only two people I believe that did not either come with a massive, whatever the biggest cooler is, the 500 quart cooler or, or flying back uh, fish. And it was just like, wow. And yet every guide here is saying it's the worst they've ever seen it. Uh, I am not a rocket scientist, but I can kind of put the two and two together. And, and, and that was a case. I wouldn't say they should go to no, no limits, but like may, maybe cut in half, maybe, maybe drop it a little bit and see what happens. See if it recovers and you get more people coming back because it's easier to catch fish. If I was a fishing guide, that would be my number one goal, right? You want it as easy as possible to go hook someone for life. That's going to keep booking you for life and having a blast because they're catching fish. Not, not, you know, just because they had one great trip and we're able to take a, a 200 quart cooler home loaded with uh, with me kind of kind of talking about like real quick rich so like what the cool factor is or what the stereotype is i kind of want to hear like comments from people what do you think looks cooler like you as an angler everybody's going to have i think a different opinion about this seeing back at the dock the dock shot of 20 fish up on pegs and everyone's like stoically standing in front of the fish or seeing one well-captured shot of you holding a quality trophy fish on a boat in your hand on camera. For me, and, and it's different for everybody, I think that the coolness factor, what would incite me to want to go out and do that or hire that guide or go fish that area is the capture of the moment. Like sometimes I look and I'll see, you know, for Canaveral, I'll see that the dock shot and, I'll, and the fish will just be They'll be up there, but it's kind of like, okay, cool. They got four Cobia and three Mahi and two Snapper and an AJ. And it, and like what happens in the moment for every single one of those fish is really, really cool in the moment, but you see the shot of them all up there together and the, the wow factor is not there for me. But seeing that one Cobia in the shot, it's like, that's a nice Cobia, man. You almost like appreciate each individual fish differently when you see those one shots than when you see the conglomerate of all the fish up spread out together. Like, so I think everybody's different. What's cooler for you seeing like the whole assortment of fish up or seeing the one that like creates the moment and the memory that, that inspires you to go out and do that. It's, it's all fully created by us, by like, what is the stereotype and the stigma of like, what's okay to do and, and what isn't cool to do the whole, like coming back, how fast you get back to the dock, man, with your limit, man. Let me see all them trout, man. Like I can, I can see that, but that is like, 
you got two, four, five hundred thousands of people that start feeling and thinking that way. And that's the social stigma, right? That's the stereotype of this is cool. This is okay. And especially if you're getting into it, you don't know any better. You kind of feed off of like what's around you regionally. Um, so this is more of a, a, we're asking the question, like, think about it for yourself, you know, listen to this podcast and kind of help shape that, that, that concept, a paradigm shift, if you will, of how you go about doing this. Yeah, that's a good point, Justin, you know, and getting back a little bit to the story as well, you know, man, I've got, I've got so many pictures of, of just us with just docs, just full. I mean, you can't even your shirt off it. too, didn't you? Couple. And, uh, <laughs> but there's just so many fish there on the dock and you look at it, you know, you got a couple of buddies around, you like, you know, that, that was a pretty good day. And it's about it, as far as you get into it. But then I've got some pictures where, man, I have got some quality fish, like a just beautiful red or like a really fat, just nice quality trout. And every single picture I have like that, I can be like, I remember exactly where that was, what I caught it on. The, the, the scenario, the day, was it overcast on top water? Like I remember all of that for that one picture versus the multitude of the dock pictures. I'm like, oh yeah, we had a pretty good day and, you know, bang them up. Um, so that's something as well that I've recently started to appreciate a lot more. Um, and going back to this too, like not getting, I promise this is on topic, but you know, this doesn't happen overnight, you know, and there's a lot of red flags leading up before it's like, oh, dang, like we're really in trouble, you know, kind of like uh, you ever think back on any of your exes, you know, like, no, probably should have seen those red flags coming up, man. They were, <laughs> they were real red and uh, they were there for sure. But no, you know, no, I know, I, I know one liked her, you know, it. <laughs> you know? Box, it was just yes, it was yes, yes, fun during the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's that. And, you know, basically what really got it for me was, you know, that exact thing, what you were talking about, Joe, like I used to could go out to one or two spots, you know, max limit out in every species, you know, that I wanted to and be back at the dock, you know, super early. And then all of a sudden now, like over the last five years, I've got to go to four five, six spots to catch the same amount of fish. Um, you know, and it's like, what's changed, you know, there's just not as many fish there. Um, and, it's, and there's it's more, there's more fishermen than ever. Right. Mm -hmm. And not as many fish. Yeah. And it's like half the spots you roll up to like, dang, there's a guy in there already. You know, it's like, there's just a lot more people on the water, um, than it used to be. So, but yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah. I, to answer that question you asked, um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not impressed by, seeing a bunch of dinky specks slapped on a on a wood board with some stakes at you know I, I you see some of those in, in venice in some areas and even you know down in the keys uh I, I was a part of one and i i was embarrassed to be in the picture but it was uh and this is not my boy hollywood this has nothing to do with like they're, they're really good about mostly catch and release and and really stewards of of the area down in Alamrada. this is in a different area and we had chartered a, a boat this is gosh, six years ago. And it was for, it was for Mahi Mai for dolphin. And, you know, the, the guy knows when they come back, it's one of the places where there's tourists everywhere at this Marina. And he's like, man, if, cause we were even, we were feeling guilty towards like, man, we have more than enough. He's like, no, no, no. Like we got to bring more back. And I was like, this is, this seems weird. And we understood why. And he told us like, man, like I make a living by coming back to that dock loaded with as many beautiful Mahi Mai as you can imagine. And we put them up on the board and he's like, that's, he's like, literally, I will get three bookings from just dropping you guys off and putting these things up. And I was like, um, and I didn't even want these fish. Like we obviously used them and gave a ton of them out, but it was, it was more than we could ever possibly eat in a month. If all we did was eat it every night, like we had seven or eight guys on the, on the trip. We all limited out. And there were a bunch of little peanut dinky, barely legal dolphin to the point, even some of the other guys who knew how to fish run the dock, like, I can't believe you guys kept all these. And like, it was, I felt guilty and like dirty. Uh, and so, but I understood the guy, I mean, the guy's making a living. So I, I get that part of it, but man, what if we, what if we changed that mind? What if he, he came back and had a, a cool digital screen up there and was like literally showing every amazing fish pick, right? I mean, a lit up Mahi that maybe we released, like, can you imagine that where almost like at, at, at Disney world, right? They take pictures of you on your roller coaster. And by the time you get done with it, you see this, the screen of all the, the people and their reactions. And, you know, a, a couple of them are scared to death and a couple of people are doing funny things. Uh, I mean, how cool would that be if, if, and then maybe that's the future of it. 
where a, a captain could yeah. have a, a card or something in the, that goes right into the to the console and boom it's as soon as you're in range it's hitting up all the images for the day up on a up on a big board and i think that would do the same for a lot of people uh just throwing that out there it's a wild kind of idea but i, I just remember being part of it luke and i luke was there too and like man this just feels like i don't even want to be in the picture uh it just it was you know what i'm talking about when you just see this little dinky and if you saw it like if we put on social media we would have been fried. I mean, absolutely fried for keeping that many small little, uh, little dolphin. So that's, that's my, my two cents on that. I love it, dude. And then just date it, right? Like this is what happened today. You're, you yeah. know, here's, here's Bethany. Like, where's your fish? It's right there. It's up <laughs> on the screen. That's, that's me. Yeah. Still have that hat with me. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, love it. Um, and I would encourage you to one, watch that video because it, it, we hadn't really even thought about this topic until we saw that video and we said, all right, let's just, uh, the topic's a little bit, not, not clickbaity, but we wanted this to be a discussion and get people's attention because it's worth starting this debate. I would also check out the release over 20. I, I do believe if there's, you know, a mostly correct answer, it'll probably lie somewhere around there. It's not just shut the whole fishery down for a year or two years. I, I don't, we're not we're not suggesting that there's probably a lot of people that would say that's, that's a good idea. And it, it probably wouldn't hurt, but I also know as fishermen, we invest a lot of money in, in, in our tackle and in our boats. And even though we know deep down, if we catch a redfish or a sheep's head or whatever it might be, it's probably the most expensive flight ever when you factor in all the cost of stuff that you, but it still feels good. Right. And, and, and for many of us, I, I know I, I talked about this on a prior podcast, it, the whole act of going out there with your son or your daughter, or your spouse or friends, and actually having a fish fry, or, you know, it doesn't have to mean you have to fry them, but having a, a cookout of, of something that you caught is an experience in, a, in of itself. And it, it's meaningful. And that's also part of, of, of a memory that will never be lost. So I, I get that part of it. And it's the same with lobstering for our family. We love it. And I'd be ticked off if someone said you can't keep lobster for five years or a year. Like, like well, how about just a couple? Um, so I, I completely get that part of it but at the same point if everyone kept the limit we would literally wipe out every fish that has a limit there is uh so we have to agree that there's there's somewhere in the middle that's probably the right answer and i i like that release over 20 just like hey let's protect the big ones and and not just because they're the breeders but the bigger they get the better the chance it's just like humans right if you try to kill off every seven foot person and only kept five foot people and below at some point, you're going to have an entire world or civilization that's five foot and below you. If you only have five foot people, you can't have seven foot people. It doesn't happen. So, you know, Dave talks about that. He's like, man, you can't have 30 inch trout. If you kill every trout over 20, at some point you need the big breeders. I mean, it's, it's, it's DNA, right? At some point you to be able to recreate something similar. You have to have some of that left. So I really love that about releasing the, the big ones, even if you're allowed to keep it, just, just release them. And we have been practicing uh, that, which I, I think is a great practice. So what, what are you guys thoughts? I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying I mean, I'm right. I'm, that's just what I'm doing. Yeah. It's, you know, it's someone who we've all been fishing for most of our lives, you know, it, it, it's evident, you know, to see, and especially in areas like where I grew up, you know, like that. And really what, what's the difference, you know, we just got a lot more people on the water. So I think, you know, it's one of those things we just need to be cognizant of. And especially, you know, we have so many new anglers on the water. They're not even aware, you know, most of the people probably aren't even aware of this is even happening. They're just like, well, the state says this, they've got all the data. Um, you know, this is probably fine. Um, but, you know, if you, look at it over the years, you know, 10 years ago, stuff like that. And some fisheries are even better right now than what they were 10 years ago, but look at what they did, um, what actions, you know, were taken and what were the consequences or reactions to that. So that's something just to think about for the future, um, for sure. Cause I know at the end of the day, you know, we all want to be able to go out and just catch fish, you know, and keep a few if we want as well. And, you know, not feel bad about it because there's, you know, not a whole lot of fish in that area, you know, um, and I've definitely started to think about it a lot more recently as well. Um, but you know, it, it goes back to what you said too, one more time, Joe, just if you're a guide, it should, you should be supportive of it. Cause one, it's going to be easier for you to get the fish Two, You don't have to, you know, bust your butt to get as many of them. So that's a benefit. And if you're a recreational guy, I mean, you can go out and maybe you hadn't been on the water in two weeks, 
you know, you, instead of being on top of that one school of fish, you know, you can go out to a, a good area and do like what we teach here at Salt Strong and still have a great day, you know, or put your kids on some fish. And it's not just a struggle the entire time. So it's kind of better all around for everybody, you know, and I'm just at the point too, where I don't like, you know, unless it's fresh fish, I don't really like the frozen stuff. It's just, it's a totally different taste. So that's kind of where I've been getting to, you know, slowly and just after that, and unfortunately throwing fillets out from the freezer, like it's not doing anybody any good, you know, go to long John silver and get some frozen stuff. Come on now. Yeah. Might as well. <laughs> Maybe. And uh, you mentioned the guide thing too. I mean, what the one positive about social media and a lot of guides have, have leveraged this is Justin those great picks, right? Cause the, what really sells someone to go get a guide is not going to their guides website or Instagram page and just seeing buckets full of dead fish, right. Or coolers full of, of fish on ice. It's smiles. It's people holding a fish and smiling with their family. Like you can say, man, these people are having a good time. I want to be a part of that. And there's been some guides who have really excelled at that of posting just really fun, great, like good looking, well-lit pictures of their customers just catching fish. And, and, and I know some of these guys and they're not, they're not keeping any of them and they're booked out for a long, long time, just by taking advantage of, of putting those fish picks up on social media. So that's, that's one cool part about, uh, about social. What do you, what do you think? What's uh what's your consensus consensus just on? Uh, I'm, I lie somewhere kind of in the middle, to be honest. I, uh, there we'll start with like keeping fish in general. I, I probably could be better with certain species of that, that area of like, what's allowed, what's, what's legal, right? What's, what's okay. Oh, by the way, I I had some of your tuna. You gave me some and uh, I'm glad you kept that tuna. It was delightful. (laughs) (laughs) Don't get me wrong. There's something special about, about keeping certain fish, but yeah, yeah, like there's a degree of like went out and got a couple tuna, shared it with friends and family. It is very special and it does taste way better than anything you're going to get at a restaurant. I mean, let's just be candid about that. So good. Uh, You know, I got, got, got a couple cobia, kept a couple cobia and probably won't be able to do that again for a couple years. So, I mean, put it in, in, into perspective, I do still keep, but within reason Um, for me, I think a lot of this has to do with how whether someone's a local to an area and fishes that same area all the time or guides you know we, we did kind of have that that not really a call out but just bringing guides into attention here because they're always fishing the same area all the time and they're serving as stewards to educate people that come to fish with them in that same area um you know we talk about you had a big shout out to the captains there in in tampa bay for their initiative to just personally catch and release and teach their clients to catch and release i think that's it's a great initiative and it's a great, it's a, it's a great practice, right? I encourage that for people in in any area, right? Like we, we had some issues with Mosquito Lagoon and Indian river. We're still experiencing those things and, and management and regulations are the same, whether it's Tampa or, 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 uh, or Indian river on Brevard County. But, you know, I do challenge that culture of there are a number of guides that still practice catch and release and tell their clients, Hey, it probably would be best given the circumstance of what's going on for this period of time to not do that. And I think that, you know, those different areas of Florida or let's say Louisiana or the Carolinas regionally perceptions change and everybody regionally has a perception of one thing or another, but we're all anglers, all these fish are for the most part, you know, they're, they're going to live in, in the same type of scenarios, whether it's you know, Richard, I'm thinking of you fishing in Georgia and throwing that line over into Florida. I mean, like I'm in Georgia, so I can keep these trout. They're so close together. There's not that much of a difference, you know, and like the fish over in Mosquito Lagoon, they're resident fish, right? They're not, they're known that that's one of the places that they will breed within that lagoon system and they won't head out to the inlets to spawn and then come back down. So what, what you do in that particular fishery definitely impacts the long term of that of that area. So a lot of this is regional, but the message I think is the same, and that's be mindful of the decisions you do and what what happens down the line, five years down the line. I fish that lagoon system a lot. I'm personally a catch and release fisherman in that region, but at the same time, I'm I'm never opposed to if I go somewhere and I'm new to the area, then I might not know any better. If I follow the you know the regulations within one trip or two trips of going, I, I might keep a fish here and there. Um, and there's no harm in that. So I do kind of fall in the middle on it. If I had to choose between 
eating a fish today or waiting a year and being able to eat fish anytime I go for the rest of my life, I would wait if, if that's if that's the call to action. If I could do it now or wait to have better rewards down the line, you know, the older that I get, the more I realize that good things come to those that wait. So that that would be my vote. He wants two cookies. No, I want them two cookies, buddy. Oh, get in my belly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, um, I think the final thing is just leave a comment. You know, if you're watching this on YouTube, please try to go over to the saltstorm.com, the fishing tips section. You'll see this podcast. Leave the comment there. That's where we're going to be checking. That's where we're going to be engaging. So all the engagement will not be on YouTube or wherever this might be posted. It's all going to be at saltstrong.com in the fishing tip section. And some of you might be watching it right there or, or listening to the podcast. Go there. Uh, we'll have all the, all the, uh, everything in the show notes from that Sims video and some other things. And then at the bottom there, leave a comment. Cause we'd love to, we'd love to hear some feedback on this. And, uh, and, and at some point it might be something we try to get involved in. We know one way or the other, um, you know, is, is a, is a club. I, I think, you know, at some point, you know, we got 26 or 7,000 members now. I mean, we, we, we can kind of, we have a lot of weight, right. And it's a lot of influence when you have that many people who are kind of voting a, a certain way. And so I, I'm interested to see where, where people are and, and just candid thoughts and no one's going to judge you. There's hope, just like, hopefully you're not thinking we're a bunch of, uh, crackheads or someone crazy uh you know it's just man it it it's tough to to have a perfect answer uh but everyone you know has a gut feeling of what we probably should be doing and um i i do i do think about it a lot because i'm still fairly young got three young kids at some point they'll hopefully have kids and i always try to look at it from you know my kids and their grandkids perspective it would really stink if it was 50 percent worse when my kids are our age, right? When they're trying to take their kids fishing and it's just impossible to get a bite, that means their kids are not going to be having fun and they're going to go, who knows what will be around with virtual reality glasses or something like, yeah, I can go catch more fish on the virtual reality and sit on my couch. Um, I don't know if you guys saw Zuckerberg's most, oh my gosh, the whole thing scares the heck out of me. <laughs> Anyhow, I digress. Uh, so leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you haven't joined us yet in the Insider Club, join us. It is the only club in America that's guaranteed to help you catch more saltwater inshore fish in less time. That means you'll be catching more fish per trip, more fish per hour. Doesn't that sound awesome? And it's all because we're giving you trends, literally daily, weekly trends. We have everything from the best tides and the best time to fish in your area. Now, dozens and dozens of fishing reports going up every hour, uh, literally in our private community. It's been really, really cool to see that grow. And that's where our 26,000, whatever it is now members are in there posting their own fishing reports. And, uh, and then of course, on the, on the other money part of side of things, we've got time and then money is the tackle everything in our store 20% off or more to all of our insider members. And we got some really, really cool stuff coming here over the next six, seven months. So stay tuned for you current insider members. Thank you guys so much. You are the rock of this company. We appreciate you so much. We'll talk to you guys on the next episode. Peace. Justin Richard. Great job.